Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we've waited the customary five minutes. Um, it's, it's probably a good time because it's a church camp to be talking about our travel that we, we took to get here. So now we're going to think about, well, it was, traffic was great. I think the longest travel was walking from the car park, am I right, to the building and then seeing all those empty car park spaces. No, just me. All right. Um, just me and Josh. We both, we both noticed that. Um, so yeah, that's the traffic talk out of the way. Um, now I think I have to relive some childhood traumas from camps begone. Um, I think the worst one for me was my first, first camp. My mum sent me on a, uh, I was in my, my fit, very, my only jeans actually, not my very best jeans, they're the only jeans I owned. And there I was in my only jeans I, I owned going on my very first trail ride, horse trail ride, two hour trail ride, and I couldn't walk for the next several days. Um, Ooh, that's childhood trauma from camps covered. Um, so, I, honestly though, I do, I think there are, there's plenty of good reasons to be on a camp and I'm pretty sure there aren't any um, horse riding uh, events happening today. Am I right there, Russ? Yes, there's no horse riding. So the only trauma you could have is, <clears throat> I guess, if you uh, see whatever I paint in the <laughs> painting uh, time later on. You can ask Kirsty about my painting um, skills. They're very low, very low. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll avoid that as well. Don't worry. Um, hey, so welcome. Um, I'm, and I guess if you want to talk about your childhood traumas from camps or um, your traffic delays coming here, do, do t tell somebody about that while you're setting up your tent um, later on this afternoon. Um, how good is church camp at home? Am I right? Am I right? Did everyone just look back at their pillow and say, I'll see you tonight? <laughs> and say, I cannot wait. You know, like, woo. <laughs> they looked at your inflatable mattress and said, not today. OK, that's great. Um, no, some people like camping. I don't know. Um, it's, who are you? I'm taking names. I'm taking names. Anyway, it's great that you could come here and you could carve out this time for church camp. Um, you know, it, so I want you to take a minute to think about the purpose that you have for coming to church camp today. For me, camps, they, they help people love each other and be loved by each other. There's a purpose for me. The camps can also set this common direction or purpose. Everyone says, yeah, we're on board with that and that's what we want to do. Um, maybe camps are going to introduce you to some people, to support some friendships, and maybe to test us. I see you introverts out there. There's going to be some testing happening. Um, and camps definitely refresh us as well. Um, refresh us as we, as we just encourage one another, as we hear God's word, um, and, as God, and as God's word works in us. Um, and of course, I think I just covered what I was gonna say there. Um, we're gonna expect that God's word will do a work in us by his spirit. Um, so I may have missed why you've come, but hopefully I've encouraged you for a reason why, another reason. Maybe there's another reason why you have shown up. If you're like me, you're thinking, well, I wonder if there's a YouTube clip or a sermon I can watch that would give me the same input. And it's this, there isn't. There isn't. This is the time, and this is the best way to do it, is to gather together and to hear God's word and to encourage, it, to encourage each other, to say God's word to each other and to have it said to us and have it applied to us. Um, we can't get that from YouTube, because if you're like me, you'll just watch America's Worst Cooks anyway. Um, or something like that. Hey, if you've seen it, it's hilarious. Um, so don't trade YouTube for a time together. Um, we're going to just so you have an idea of what's going to happen this morning. Um, I'm, soon I'm going to stop talking and we're going to have some, we're going to be led in worship with two songs. Um, we are, I'm going to interview, we're going to watch a video. I'm going to interview uh, Carl, who's who's um, sitting over there, that's all right, he'll be up here soon for the interview, don't worry. And um, then uh, we're going to have a prayer, another song, talk a bit more about some housekeeping. And that's the, that's the morning, so if you are the type that likes to have the big picture, that's it. Um, I'd like to lead, get us to think about Jesus now. Um, John 1 is what I'm going to read, because it's got a tent reference. It's got the start of a tent reference, and I think it's helpful for us to think about Jesus and camping. 
John 1 from 14. The word, that's Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling or set up his camp or his tent um, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Brackets. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said he, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Brackets. Out of his fullness, Jesus, out of his fullness, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So everyone today, I hope that we can pursue the grace and truth given through Jesus. Um, let's pray together. I'm going to lead us in a prayer from the Valley of Vision, um, and I'm going to invite the musicians up as well. Uh, Lord Jesus, you are the lover of our souls. Your love reaches out to us in acts of sacrifice. May we see the rich extent of your love for us in the manger of your birth, in the garden of your agony, in the cross of your suffering, in the tomb of your resurrection, and in the heaven of your intercession. May your love for us make us bold to defy the devil, resisting his scheming, renounce the world, and be courageous for truth. Knowing that we are loved, may that deepen our spiritual purpose in life and deepen our relationship with you as our Lord and King, our friend and Savior, our rightful judge. How unlovely we are and how unworthy we are to receive your love. We think of your glory and our corruption, your majesty and our meanness, your beauty and our deformity, your purity and our uncleanness, your righteousness and our sinfulness. How great is your love, unmerited and undeserved. You love because it's your nature to love despite our unworthiness. So your love is constant, everlasting and unchanging. May we love as we are loved. You've given yourself for us. May we give ourselves to you. You've died for us. May we live for you in every moment of our time, in every thought of our mind, in every beat of our heart. May we never be enticed by the world and its attractions, but ever walk by your side, listen to your voice, and be continually transformed by your grace and always robed in your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you'll stand with us, we're going to sing. Um, band, if I can invite you up. Um, the first one, is it to How Great Thou Art? Is that what we're doing? Yeah. We're going to do How Great Thou Art, a lovely, lovely um, song to remind us as we're thinking about the, the walking through the trees and what have us about us. So do stand with us.
one song to probably a song not many of you might have heard before. But um, so a, uh, a very good strategy I have for you guys is to just look very confident. <laughs> and just remember that nobody else is going to hear you really. So just, <laughs> just sing anyways.
great song, to, uh, great, two great songs to start us off with, fixing our eyes on the, the majesty and glory of God. Um, in case I didn't say before, my name's Joel, I'm from Shore Hope, and now I'm going to introduce you to a video. So just stare at the screen, please, and here it is. Camp at home. Sienna, what have you enjoyed about church camp at home so far? I've enjoyed the movie that we watched. It was so crazy. Here we are with Pam, who's on the kitchen. Pam, what do we have on the menu tonight? We have most exceptional free roll. We have white with jam and cream. And we have some special treats for those who have special diets and meals. Sounds very delicious. And I'm here with Murray at Church Camp at Home. Hi Murray, what are you enjoying about Church Camp at Home so far? I'm loving these interviews. <laughs> oh, I'm liking the food. And we heard some really good stories tonight. Uh, history of our church, which was great. Um, but I, I love hearing of questions. What else have you got? Robin, what's it for lunch today? Well, we have the most amazing wraps. We have the most amazing sushi. We have fruit. We have lollies. We have all the other things I can't think of. <laughs> Sounds delicious. Look forward to eating it. Janet? Janet, how was just like this? It has been known. I have dressed in pajamas for various occasions, yes. Interesting choice. Um, Janet, what are the children doing today? Today, they're going to be involved in Mission Impossible investigations as you can see we've got evidence, top secrets, briefcases. It's going to be quite an exciting day. This has been Redlands Youth News on Church Camp at Home. There will be more updates later as the story develops. Great, thanks youth. Um, Carl, can I invite you to come on up? So, I, I haven't written down the questions here. <laughs> they're, they're on my phone. Um, Carl, where, where, which, where have you hailed from? Where have you come from I've come just to, now? I've come from Sydney. Yeah, so from the inner west of Sydney, from Croydon. So, uh, I flew up yesterday. So, and I, I'm wearing this jumper as a statement. It's saying, <laughs> it's not that warm here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Make of that what you will. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 still, I'm still thinking, because I thought that you were also, a, pr prior to Sydney, you were from Tasmania. I was from Tasmania, that's right. From yeah. Launceston, so I'm thinking, not that cold up here in Queensland. That's right. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. That's not one of my questions here, yeah. okay. Um, so you spent 10 years, or over 10 years, in ministry in Launceston, and now you're involved in training others for ministry at SNBC. Yep, that's right. So yep. how did that change happen, going from one to ministry to the other? Yeah, so I was in Launceston for a, about 11 years, pastoring a church, um, and I'd, I'd done my PhD, I'd, I'd done further kind of theological study while I was working as a pastor, and I guess then for year, a number of years I was thinking about where, where does God want me to be serving him, does he want me in the church, does he want me uh, teaching in a Bible college, uh, so for a while I was doing both at the same time, part-time teaching in a Bible college in Melbourne and then pastoring a church. But then at the end of 20, what year are we in now? Gosh, end of 2021, I think it was. Uh, an opportunity came up at Sydney Missionary and Bible College. And um, yeah, it was kind of suited to what I was doing, which is teaching theology, but then also really trying to train and equip pastors, uh, kind of form them spiritually and in terms of their character. Uh, I just saw an increasing need for that. I, I think Bible College is always trying to do that, but just have a real passion for seeing people well equipped uh, for the rigours of pastoral ministry. Yeah. Uh, that really gives us an insight into your heart of um, wanting to see uh, the, the pastors of tomorrow mm. um, trained and, as you said, uh, improved in their character or um, developed in their character. So thanks for sharing that. Um, my, now, you know that in Queensland, we spend our days off going to Bible talks and... Um, That's what I've heard. Uh, yeah. We gather together just pretty much every day off. And I just wondered, in Sydney, what's, what does a day off look like for you? Yeah. 
Well, normally we're up at three o'clock for prayer vigils. Um, and that would run through till 11 or 12 at night. Um, there's a lot of... <laughs> that's right, there's a lot of... Um, no, look, for me, a, a day off, I'm not, I, I once, uh, one of my ministry mentors, the first time I met him, he said to me, you're in danger of becoming the most boring person I've ever met. Um, yeah. Uh, so I try to be more interesting. I, I mountain, I've taken up, well, I took up mountain bike riding while I was in Tasmania. It's a bit harder to do in Sydney. I'm in the middle of, kind of close to the centre of Sydney. So it takes me about 40 minutes to drive to a mountain bike park and about 20 bucks return in tolls. tolls. So uh, it's a high level commitment, <laughs> uh, but that's what I do. I, I ride my mountain bike, I, uh, I play a bit of trombone, I used to play in an orchestra, I don't do that anymore. Read, that's kind of, yeah. Okay. You'll find, I think, a lot of um, uh, empathy amongst the mountain bikers here. We've got some really good mountain bikers oh, really? here. Oh, really? It's a thing up here? It was massive in It's Tassie. a thing up here, yeah, yes. Okay. It's a thing. Um, great. Well, you can go back and take a seat, but only for a short time because Ben, I think, are you around? Are you going to come up and read, read the scripture to us? And Ben's going to read um, the scripture to us, and then, Carl, I'm going to invite you straight back up, all right? All right. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so we'll be reading from Hebrews this morning, uh, and if you do happen to have a church Bible in front of you, it's on page 843. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it then that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. It's so uh, lovely to be here uh, with you on your church camp. Um, I, I think I must be the only one who's, who doesn't have my own pillow. Uh, my pillow is back in Sydney, so, uh, uh, but it's great to be here with you and, and great to be spending some time thinking with you about the church. Uh, it's something that I've thought a lot about when I was a pastor, something that I thought a lot about um, when, I, when I teach, it's something I think a lot about when I teach uh, Bible college students about what the church is, so really looking forward to, to this weekend and, and praying that God will use this. Let's... Let's pray that now. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessings of the church. Lord, we thank you that you've created uh, your church, uh, that you've called it into existence through the gospel, uh, that you've formed it in Jesus. Lord, we pray now that as we dig into your word that you'd help us to know what the church is. Uh, and Lord, uh, that you would help us to live as your church for the glory of your name. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Um, well, I remember as a kid, uh, I remember as a kid loving to look at the tools in my dad's garage. Uh, I was quite into sort of doing things, sawing things in half, hitting things, uh, screwing things together. Uh, there were all kinds of tools uh, there, saws, hammers, drills, pliers, rulers, chisels, planes, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and lots of the tools I knew and lots of the tools I could make sense of. But I remember sometimes delving into hidden drawers or uh, opening cabinets and finding tools that I didn't really know what they were, couldn't explain. Uh, of course, some things were obvious, screwdrivers, it made sense. You could, uh, even if you'd never kind of seen one before, you could work out that it obviously matched up with, with 
screws, uh, and you can kind of work out what they're for. But other tools I found completely mystifying. They looked interesting, they looked fun, but I didn't know what they were for. And, and one of the ones that I found mystifying was an impact driver. Now, I don't know if you know what an impact driver is, but it looks like a screwdriver, but you hit it with a hammer. Uh, and those two things didn't really seem to go together in my mind. Uh, sometimes, I think, things are like that. That is, you know what something is, you know how it works, and you can use it, but other times in life, we can't make sense of what they're for. We need a little bit of help understanding how things work. That's true of tools. It's also true of other things. It's true of things like marriage. We recognise that marriage is wonderful, can be wonderful, but it can also be challenging and complex. And so we recognise, mostly most churches would recognise, that when people are thinking about getting married, we want to spend some time with them, helping them to understand what married life is like. Uh, uh, we, we run uh, marriage, pre-marriage counselling. We uh, have marriage enrichment ser seminars for those who are already married uh, because we recognise the complexity. Workplaces, too, recognise the complexity of uh, their environment, so they often have uh, introductions for new workers because uh, they recognise that there are things that are not obvious that they need to be taught. And really, I think the same is true of the church. A church is complex, it's a wonderful gift of God, but it can also be challenging. And there are lots of things that happen uh, that we might take for granted, the things that we've always done, that we just do, that maybe we do or don't understand, and things that we don't know why we do them and why we might not do them. Uh, and I think that can be problematic. It's problematic not to understand what church is about. And it really helps us to live as the church, live as God's people, uh, when we understand what the church is and what it does. And so what I want to do with you over the three talks that we're going to do while I'm here uh, over this camp is I want to think with you about what the church is uh, and what it does and maybe about uh, some of our expectations about that. So in this talk, we're thinking about what the church does. In the next one, we're going to think about uh, how the church does that, the mechanics of church life, and then the last one we'll think about the weaknesses and disappointments maybe that uh, we experience in church life. So in this talk we're going to go right back to the beginning and think about what the church is uh, and how that shapes what we do and how we think about the church. And the first thing to say in thinking about the church is that the church is first of all a gathering. That really is the idea now, one of the key ideas at the heart of what it means to be the church. So the word that early Christians used to describe the church was one that's drawn from uh, the Old Testament and also from the wider Greek world that the people were living in. So the Greek word that they used was a, a word uh, ecclesia, and its background lies in Greek democracy. So in Greek democracy, this thing, this ecclesia, was an assembly of citizens that would meet regularly in a particular place, in a city. They might meet 30 to 40 times a year, and they would make decisions about the city. It was kind of like the People's Council or something like that. Uh, and so there were people of the city who were considered to be members of this uh, group, and they would meet together to make decisions about the city. Uh, but that same word was also used uh, by the translators of the Old Testament. So back in the days of Jesus, there was already a translation of the, of the Bible that had been made uh, from Hebrew in the, old, the Hebrew Old Testament and had been translated into Greek. Uh, and there they had used that same word, this word ecclesia, they'd used that to refer to one of the really significant gatherings of God's people in the Old Testament. And that was a gathering that God uh, instituted when he brought the people out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai. He gathered them at Mount Sinai. He gave them the Ten Commandments and the instructions for the tabernacle. Uh, and that, these translators translated that as an ecclesia, this word that we call church, that we've translated church. Uh, and it's that particular church meeting, if you like, at Mount Sinai between God and his people that's picked up by the writer of Hebrews in the words that we just read. Uh, he begins there in verse 18 to 21, and he describes that first meeting. And he says, actually, this first church service was 
spectacularly ter terrifying. Uh, there was lightning, there was gloom and storm, uh, and there was the voice of God speaking to them. But rather than that being a really welcome event, wow, isn't it precious that God is speaking to us, they were absolutely terrified by the voice of God. Uh, in fact, they, they begged Moses to ask God not to speak directly to them. And the writer of Hebrews says, uh, the good news for us as Christians is we haven't come to that church meeting. Rather, we've come to another one. A meeting, he says, in the heavenly places with angels, with all those who belong to God, uh, with the names of the people, uh, with those whose names are written in heaven. Uh, it's a meeting, he says, of the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Uh, he says, we've come to a better church gathering uh, and it's this heavenly gathering. It's the gathering of God's people spiritually around God's throne in heaven. It's a gathering around Jesus, the Messiah. It's a gathering of the people who trust in him. And in many ways, that is the kind of the most fundamental reality of the church. That is, it's an invisible and it's a spiritual thing. It's an invisible and a spiritual gathering around the throne of God in heaven. That's the most fundamental reality of the church. But also it's important to recognise that that hidden reality is then manifested in visible ways in our church communities here on earth. So there's that hidden reality, but that works its way out in ordinary life. So we see that again and again in the New Testament. We see Christians meeting together. Uh, they didn't meet together as the worldwide church. They, they couldn't do that. that. That wasn't realistic. It wasn't practical. They were scattered in all kinds of different lands. They spoke different languages. But they did meet together as little groups of believers. Uh, and in fact, the writer of Hebrews in his, earlier in his letter, before he talks about this great church service uh, in heaven, uh, he actually says to the believers, don't give up meeting together in the places where you are. Don't give up meeting together. In other words, they can't just say to themselves, well, it's great, we're gathered around Jesus in heaven by the Spirit. Uh, I don't need to worry about being part of a local church. No, he says you need to keep meeting together. This invisible reality influences and leads to a kind of visible, practical outworking. I had a strange question that someone asked me recently. People, you know, over time, particularly when you teach theology, people kind of get in touch with weird questions. The question was this. There's a young couple getting married soon. Do they need to live together? And I thought, I don't understand the question. Isn't that the purpose of getting married, to begin a life living together? That is, there's a kind of a reality. It's, if you like, it's a kind of a hidden reality. That is, marriage is a kind of an idea. <laughs> but it works its way out in practical ways, invisible ways. It's a word, it's a promise, but it works its way out. And really, it's the same with the church. There's an invisible reality gathered around Christ by faith in the heavenly places, but that finds its expression in daily life. Our weekly gatherings uh, and even daily gatherings as a community of God's people are reflections of this hidden reality. They're reflections, they're also anticipations of one day when Christ returns and gathers all his people uh, physically uh, in the new creation. And so at the heart of the idea of church, this biblical idea of church, is this idea of gathering. Gathering in the heavenly places and then that being reflected in gathering as a regular community of believers. That has two implications, I think. The first is if the most fundamental idea is being gathered around Christ by the Spirit, uh, then we actually need to be gathered around Christ by the Spirit. That is... Uh, this is not a, a, probably a revolutionary idea to many of you, but uh, that is to say belonging to the church, the church, is not something that just happens by belonging to a local church. 
Turning up in a church doesn't make you a believer, doesn't make you a Christian, it doesn't make you a person gathered around Christ by the Spirit. That has to happen by faith. That's something that God does. You can turn up to church for 50 years, be involved in all the church programs, but unless you're gathered by faith around Christ, then you're not part of the church. That's the first thing. But second, we also need to remember that it's not only the spiritual reality that matters. We need to keep enacting and reflecting that heavenly gathering in our Christian communities. And those local gatherings, like now, might often seem very insignificant, ordinary, plain, weak, unspectacular, but actually behind them stands stands this profound reality of Hebrews chapter 12. That is that we're gathered around Christ in the heavenly places. So the first idea, the most central idea, I think, in the church is this idea of being gathered around Christ in the heavenly places and then as a community, local community. Uh, But the New Testament shows us something else as well, and that is that the church is also a new humanity. It's not just a gathering, it's a new humanity. So turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to work through that passage with you uh, and the rest of the time in this talk. So Ephesians chapter 2, and then from verse 11. So Paul writes, he's just talked about uh, God's plan of salvation from the creation of the world uh, and how uh, Christ has brought reconciliation with God, uh, forgiveness of sins and so forth. Uh, And then he says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. So Paul is writing to a Gentile church, so they're non-Jewish, and he's saying that in the Old Testament era, the the Gentiles, these non-Jews, by and large, were far away from God. So all the privileges that God uh, sort of uh, offered or provided came first and foremost to the people of Israel. So they were far away. But then he continues, he says, but now, okay, so that was the case, far away, but now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, so God's work has brought them near, uh, these Gentiles, these non-Jews, near to God. God's forgiveness and uh, through Christ and his death has made that possible. But it also turns out, Paul goes on to say it's not just these non-Jews, these Gentiles who were far away and needed to be reconciled to God. Actually, it turns out the Jews needed to be reconciled to God as well. So verse 16, Paul says that God's plan was in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Okay, so notice Paul is not saying God is reconciling them to each other. Jews and Gentiles to each other, we'll say that in a bit, but actually the first thing that needs to happen is that both of them, Jews and Gentiles, need to be reconciled to God. Okay, so in in the death of Jesus, God has done that. He's put to death the hostility between us and him. Uh, And then in verse uh, verse 17, he says, he came and preached uh, peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. Okay, so both needed to hear peace. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Okay, so Paul is really, in, in different words, saying the same kind of thing that the writer of Hebrews said. Uh, we've been gathered around Christ uh, uh, by the Spirit, uh, gathered to, to him as his people. So there's this key consequence of the gospel, peace with God, but it's importantly, it's not the only consequence. So Paul says in verse 14 to 15, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, 
By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Okay, so what's Paul saying? He's saying not only has God brought us near to himself, he also says that God has, uh, in doing that, has created one new humanity out of the two. So there's something quite profound and quite important going on here that's really helpful to understand. Uh, that is, all of us who are born into this world are born, if you like, as children of Adam. Uh, but as children of Adam, we're condemned and we're corrupted. Okay? We're born sinners, we're objects of wrath by nature. Paul says that at the beginning of Ephesians 2. But Jesus, in taking on humanity, has not only accepted uh, the condemnation that was due to us, so brought forgiveness for sins, He's also forged in his own person a renewed humanity. Okay, so Adam in the garden was told, Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree. And they failed the test. They failed to be obedient. Jesus has done what Adam, and indeed what Israel, was unable to do. He took on humanity, but he passed uh, the test, he was perfect, always perfect and blameless. Uh, and Paul says, in doing that, he's created this one new humanity out of the two. Uh, and when we come to Jesus, we're not only forgiven, but we actually become participants with him in that new humanity. Okay, so he's forged this new humanity and we share in that with him. So the Holy Spirit comes to us, unites us with Jesus, with his person, such that all that he's attained becomes ours as well. Okay, so the Bible describes that in, in language like being born again. We're born again into a new family, into the family of God, which is something existential. Okay, so that's a, that's a big word, but bear with me. That is, it's something that changes us at the level of our existence, existential. Okay, so the gospel is not just, it's importantly, it's a kind of a legal thing. We talk about forgiveness of sins. God in the courtroom declares us to be right with him, to be forgiven. But there's also something existential that takes place at the level of our being. Uh, we're not just called God's children. We actually become God's children in a profound way. Uh, we are united to the person of Christ and we are being made more like him. And we become sons of God. Uh, we share, if you like, of something of God's DNA, to put it in a kind of a crass way. Uh, that is, we, the image of God is restored back to us. So when a human family adopts a child, uh, the child is brought into the family, but remains always different on the outside. They remain unlike the others. But the profound thing about the gospel is that when God brings us into his family, he actually makes us part of the family. The image of God is restored. I'm not, I'm not saying he makes us divine. <laughs> That's not what's going on. But he makes us part of the family. The image of God that we were created to have but lost or was distorted he restores that to us. He, rem he remakes us so that we're like Jesus. What's the point? The point is that belonging to the heavenly church is something that changes us. Okay? It's impossible to join the church, the church, and to stay the same as you were before that. If you're the same person that you were five years ago or 50 years ago, then there are good reasons for wondering whether you're really part of the, he the heavenly gathering around Christ. Because people who belong to that gathering are different. They're being transformed into the image of Jesus as they behold him. They bear the fruit of the Spirit. They're more loving, more joyful, more peaceable, more patient, kinder, gentler, more faithful, more self-controlled than they were before. 
They love God more. They love their brothers and sisters in Christ more. They love their neighbours more. And so if you don't see any change, then it's worth asking the question, do you belong to the church? By the Spirit of God. And if you begin to suspect that you don't, then the answer is to acknowledge that, confess that to God, and seek his forgiveness in Jesus, and ask him to make you part of that heavenly gathering, to to unite you with Christ. So we should be wary of no change in us, but we should also be wary of no real change in in the people around us. That is, if there are others in the church who seem to be the same as they were five years ago or ten years ago or fifty years ago, then we should be deeply concerned for them. Because it's impossible to be part of the church and to be the same as we always were. Now, we need patience and wisdom and kindness to deal with that. We shouldn't be running off to anybody the moment we think that they haven't changed because maybe there are things that God is doing in their lives that we haven't seen. But we need, with great humility and gentleness, to speak to people whose lives seem to be unchanged by the realities of the gospel. Because people who are gathered around Christ are changed to be like Christ. They're a new humanity in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that we'll be perfect, but it does mean that there'll be a fundamental uh, change over time. So what's the church? It's, It's a gathering, spiritual, reflected in local churches. It's a new humanity. It's an existential thing. It changes our existence Uh, Third, it's a family. Okay, so a key consequence of being born again uh, is not just being changed as an individual, but it means inclusion into the family of God, uh, inclusion with other believers into the family of God. So we saw before that the beginning of Ephesians, or this beginning of this passage in Ephesians 2, talks about two races, the Jews and the non-Jews, and how they are separated from God, but... Paul is not only saying they are separated from God, they're also separated from each other. And this new humanity that he creates is a new humanity out of the two. Paul says in that process of reconciling people to God, these two groups are not only reconciled to God, but also to each other. There's no longer Jews and Gentiles, but only the family of God. So, Paul can say in Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Those distinctions disappear because there's a new identity, a new family arrangement. We belong to God's family. And that unity that we have as this new humanity transcends all the other kind of unique characteristics that distinguish us from each other. It's interesting, a friend of mine once observed, he said, if someone asks you what's the most important things about you to know, what are the most, who are you, uh, what kinds of things do we say? Well, this is my job. Um, I'm an engineer, I'm a, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a childcare worker. Uh, I like chocolate. I don't like chocolate. Uh, I like barbecues. I don't like barbecues. All those kind of secondary characteristics. They are not the most important thing. The most important thing is that we belong to Jesus. That is our primary identity. Don Carson, uh, the theologian, writes this. He says, Ideally, however, the church itself is not made up of natural friends. It's made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together not because they form a natural collection, but because they have all been saved by Jesus Christ 
and owe him a common allegiance. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. That's an important idea, I think, because although we might sign off on that on paper, the reality, I think, in many places is that we don't actually really live like that or believe that. So one of the most prominent areas, I think, where that plays out is with age. Uh, So people often leave one church to find another because they want to find people their own age or alternatively to find people of the age of their children. Now, at one level, I can understand that. uh, But at another level, what that does is it perpetuates this vision of a church where what unites us is something primarily other than the gospel. What unites us is that that we are the same age or we share the same interests or like doing the same things together. I once uh, worked for a year in a church in a small town in Tasmania on the northwest coast. I think the population was about 15,000 people or something like that. And the church there that I was ministering in had no one like me. I mean, you might think, well, that's not surprising, Carl. Um, You're in danger of being the most boring person that anyone's ever met. Uh, But there was no one like me. There There was no one really my age that I can remember. Uh, There was certainly no one with the same interests that I had. Uh, But because my job was to do ministry, because I was there to do that, I ended up joining uh, a Bible study full of old ladies. Now, I think they were all over the age of 70. Uh, I think every one of them was widowed. And we would meet on a Thursday night to do Bible study. But it was actually a really lovely time. Uh, we went out for lunch uh, together sometimes. I remember my sister came to visit and two of them invited my sister and I out to an RSL in Devonport, one of the other local kind of towns. Uh, They invited me over for dinner at their homes. Uh, And when I had to leave the church at the end of the year, one of them knitted me a cardigan. uh, And we all went out together at the local RSL um, in the town. They were so unlike me except for the gospel, but they were family. And the only reason I think that I had that experience was because I went, instead of going into that situation saying, what will these people bring me? Because I was there to do a job, ministry, I I went there with the attitude, how can I serve them? And so I came away incredibly blessed by them and their love and their kindness. So often I think we close ourselves off to those possibilities and those opportunities because we select our involvement with others in the church community based on those other criteria. Are they my age? Are they married? Are they not married? Do they have kids? Do they have kids the same age as my kids? Do they like doing the same things that I like to do? Do they share the same political convictions that I do? But that's actually not what the church is. The church is a family united by God through Jesus. So the church is a a gathering around Christ in the heavenly places, reflected in our local communities gathering uh, week by week. Uh, It's a new humanity born again through the Spirit of Christ. It's a family. Uh, And finally, the church is a building being built together. So Paul says in verse 19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. When I was growing up, the one thing that I knew about church, because everyone said it over and over and over again, is the church is not the building. Which is true. But it's very interesting that in the Bible, the church is often described as being like a building. 
Now, Paul says the church is like a building in a number of ways here. First, it's like a building in that Jesus is the cornerstone, so its shape and its alignment comes from Jesus. Second, it's like a building in that it has a foundation. The foundation here, he says, is the teachings uh, written down for us in the Bible of the apostles and prophets. Uh, Third, the church is like a building, or more specifically, it's like a temple in that God dwells there by his spirit. But finally, the church is also like a building in that the people in it are being built together. We're living stones, the Bible says, being formed into a building. And that last idea, I think, is so important. And I think it's one that's very helpful for us because it's also one that we often struggle with. Uh, We're being built together. But what does that actually mean? Well, at one level, it means that being built together with others is a fundamental part of belonging to Jesus. Okay, so you can't be a brick on your own. Uh, A brick on its own is not, this might be a revelation, is not a building. Uh, You need lots of bricks to make a building. Uh, And so the New Testament says we need to be with others. Uh, We need to be built together with others. So Paul in Ephesians 4 says that the church, the members of the church, are to build one another up. How how are we built together? Well, it implies that we need to be together, to minister to each other, so that we can be built together. But the understanding of the church as a building also has a far more radical implication, I think. And that is... It, it implies that at the heart of the, our Christian self-identity, self-conception, is not me as an individual, but us as a building. Not me as an individual, but us as a building. That is, the end goal is a beautiful building, not beautiful bricks. So uh, I've used this illustration before, but the sales of the Sydney Opera House. Has anyone, who's been to, to see the Sydney Opera House? The sales of the Sydney Opera House are made up of millions of tiles. Uh, and if you go up and stand next to the tiles, which I did a couple of years ago, don't go there that often, but if you go and stand up next to the, the sales and you see the tiles, it kind of looks like a bad 70s bathroom. Right, the, the tiles are they're actually a bit shabby. It's, it's, it's a little bit disappointing. Right? Any of those, uh, those, those tiles are not that spect- spectacular. But when you stand back and look at the whole building, it's breathtaking. Right? It's one of the, the great pieces of architecture in the world. Uh, now, you don't look at the Opera House and think, wow, what a great bunch of tiles. You, you look at the Opera House and you think, what a great building. And in fact, if you were to, in the middle of the night, take a crowbar and wrench one of those tiles off and take it home and put it in your room at home and hang it on the wall, it would not be that impressive. (laughs) People are like, what is that (laughs) dirty tile uh, on your wall? Why why is that? Why, Why would it be not impressive? It's because... The, the wonder of the tile comes from the, the wonder of the building, not the other way around. And I think the New Testament wants us to think about the church and us as members of the church in the same way. We tend to think of the church as all of us with our individual brilliance coming into the church to make a wonderful building. But actually, it's the other way around. It's this wonderful building, and we carry that shared identity in Jesus into the places where God puts us. To think of it in another in terms of another biblical image, the body doesn't get its significance and identity from the parts, but the parts get their identity and significance from the body. You know, it's not a great liver and just a really wonderful kidney that all come together to form the body, but it's the it's the body which is the primary idea. That's not to eliminate the differences between us, 
Rather, it's as Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 12, I think, it's to frame the distinctions that we have within the context of this more fundamental idea, which is a body. Uh, God's plan is not to make simply beautiful individuals, but it's rather to shape a beautiful building made up of individuals. When God knocks a rough edge off us, it's not simply so that you and I would be more beautiful bricks, but rather it's so that we would fit more beautifully with the other bricks that God has put around us. Yes, our identity is ultimately found in Christ, but Christ is the cornerstone of a building and he's the head of a body. And so belonging to our local churches shapes us. Your belonging here in this place shapes you. It changes you. You're being built together. And as you're being built together, you're being changed and you're being changed for the better. You're being built to connect with others more profoundly. There's so much to say, I think, about uh, the church and what it is. But these four ideas, I think, are close to the heart or perhaps the most important four ideas that the Bible gives us. The church is a gathering around Christ, a gathering which is reflected in our local churches. It's a new humanity being transformed into the image of Christ. It's a family that belongs together with all its differences and it's a building being built together uh, by the Spirit of God. Let me pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, um, and we just thank you for the wonder of the church or that you've called us through the gospel uh, to belong to you, to be gathered already now with Christ, to be raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. Uh, Lord, we pray that each one of us would, would truly be gathered there through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, and Lord, we pray that um, this church here and this local community would faithfully uh, continue to live out that invisible reality in visible ways, uh, gathering together uh, each week, uh, through the week, in times like this, Lord, to reflect uh, those heavenly realities in Christ Jesus. Lord, pray too for this church that uh, it will be a church of transformed people being remade in the image of Christ, uh, that it will be a family of people uh, whose primary identity is in belonging to Jesus uh, and that it will be a church being built together with all the rough edges being knocked off Lord, to make a really beautiful building to the glory of your name. Pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Do you still want me to pray? Lord, God in heaven, you are the living God. You are the God who took on flesh, Lord, and entered your own creation. Lord, we know of you as the cornerstone, as, as Isaiah prophesied that you would be a plumb line of righteousness and a measuring line of justice, Lord, entering your own creation, full of grace, Lord, to serve and to love, for us to imitate, Lord, the hard, the difficult work of, of laying aside our selfish ambition and envy and pride to gather, to seek to grow like you, to build the church, to build one another up. Lord, it, it is hard work, but the work was first done by your apostles who you sent out to the world who lay the foundation, Lord. And we think of Stephen also full of grace, giving testimony to you, Lord, and, and being the first martyr, Lord. Your church goes out to all nations, to the lowly, to the brokenhearted, to the poor, Lord. But your word is truth, and your truth goes through all. And it grows up, it goes into every status of society because... There's no denying truth, Lord. We can try to suppress it, but it'll rise, Lord. So, Lord, help us to be people of truth, 
and people of light, Lord, to be a church after your own heart, to put aside ourselves and to seek to serve, Lord. What a wonderful encouragement we have today from Carl, Lord, and his study and his deep thinking about who you are and what you call us to be. So, Lord, help us to enjoy this day, enjoy one another, enjoy food, enjoy company, enjoy the noise. It won't be enjoyment for everyone, so make us patient and kind and understanding with others so, so that ultimately you will be glorified in, in, in the unity and the, and the spirit in which we do this day. Amen. Thank you, Norm, and thank you, Carl. Can I invite the musicians up? And we're going to be singing another song. There is one gospel. Thank you. 